introduce the context of this event. Um, we're doing this as uh, the first Sridhar lecture, and uh, we need to tell you what Sridhar is all about and what rather means to, uh, Sridhar means to us. Um, I don't know if uh, uh, any of you have seen or met or spoken with Sridhar. Um, many of you wouldn't have unless you had come to Dodin, an event that we organize every year um, until we were hit by COVID. And even then, and even then he was at Dodin. Uh, he was at Lama Khan also a few times. A so um, you can see him, the face on the screen. Um, Sridhar was wheelchair bound for um, about half of his life, a little more than half of his life. Um, he was an amazing uh, uh, developer. And for many of us uh, who worked with him very closely, um, it means many things, um, both in terms of human spirit, but also in terms of what technology can do for the human spirit. Because here was a young person at the age of 18, hit by a very rare disease that essentially leads to the fusion of the bones in his spinal column, um, progressively making it impossible for him to uh, move around by himself. So he's essentially folded up like that into a wheelchair at the age of 18, slowly progressing like that. Many people actually don't survive it into their 30s. They die because there are heart diseases or kinds of problems like that. But Sridhar survived into his 40s, early 40s. Uh, he traveled a lot with his friends. He traveled a lot more uh, through his poetry. He wrote a lot of poetry in Hindi, English, and Telugu. And that's what he was doing at Dodin, uh, an annual event that we organized. We could never have an evening, uh, the evening cultural program start at Dodin without Sridhar first reciting the, the poems. Um, my relationship with him, Sridhar, actually started with Farhan bringing him into Hyderabad Urban Lab. And I'm the director of Hyderabad Urban Lab. I didn't introduce myself. My name is Anand. Um, in Hyderabad Urban Lab, um, Sridhar helped us build our first online mapping platform, which basically meant that we were, for the first time, able to go around the city and put places on a map without any complications, without any difficulties at all. And imagine what it does to the city politics, because you know for the first time what's happening where. Because the, the, the reason why a lot of our politics in, in our country are actually very, very stifled, very inert, is because we have lists of names. We don't know where things are happening. Whether you're talking about the location of public toilets, or you're talking about where the voting is happening, or where you're talking about the location of amenities, we don't have maps. We just have lots and lots and lots of strings of text with no georeferencing. What Farhan did, uh, well, what Sridhar did, was to give us that ability to put things on maps and see spatial relationships very, very quickly. And that helped us then actually build a tool for understanding how climate change affects locations in the city. We actually put together a tool for figuring out what happens if the precipitation that is rain goes beyond a certain level, what will, which, which of the areas in the city would get inundated. If the, the temperatures go up, which areas are likely to be affected? We could visualize all of these things online because of the tools that he helped us put together. He was also the person who was constantly helping us on the spur coming up with quick websites that helped us connect, tell stories in all kinds of ways. We made maps of, uh, of, of all the schools across Telangana. We made maps of all the bus routes, which is an amazingly uh, uh, valuable thing at that time because there were all kinds of researchers who wanted to come to Hyderabad Urban Lab to make apps that would predict when the next bus would come. And the moment we told them that, look, the problem is that we don't know where the bus stops are, they would say, no, 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 we only know how to do the coding. You produce the data, and then we will do this, right? But we had one young person who said that we will do this, and Sridhar worked with that person to put together a tool whereby people could just go into the city and very quickly put all the data together. This was a time when Google was not this well developed. We actually mapped most of Hyderabad city on OpenStreetMap. 
And I'm proud to tell you that actually with the data that we put together, Google was constantly stealing at night from us. Every time we put data on, on the website, <laughs> Google was taking it out at night. We know this because there were times when some of our more mischievous young people would deliberately put bogus data up there to see where it would land up and would very surely land up on Google. So we knew this, right? So Sridhar, when I had been out of touch with him for a few months, suddenly decided to leave us. And I was shocked when I found out. I really didn't know what to make of it because I hadn't been in touch with him for three months. And then I had contacted him. His phone was not responding. I kept trying. And then his father picked up the phone and said that, look, he's not here anymore. And so I didn't know what to do. So I just rushed to the house. And I, I got to know that it actually left us a month and a half before I went to the other house. And the way it happened is, 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 is a very, very moving story. In the month of May, he went into the hospital because he was feeling very low. And he was feeling low because the lockdown meant that he was not able to meet the friends that he was able to meet all through. That was a very big thing for him. Because his classmates from high school onwards were constantly in touch with him. They would come meet him. They would take him out. He traveled across India with those friends, and they were not meeting him as frequently anymore. And that meant that he was slowly beginning to feel that he was not really in touch with what's happening around him. And then he went into the hospital in night in, 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 for, 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 a, for, a, for, a, for a short time in May. And I do remember speaking to him at that time. He said that he was not feeling very well. And he said that it had something to do with the way he was feeling mentally and emotionally. And I spoke to him at length. And then we left it at that because he was also helping me actually put together a lot of resources for, for actually providing relief during the lockdown. He, he mobilized people, he mobilized friends to raise resources to provide support to schools, to community kitchens, and so on and so forth. So all of that work was, was, was with him. He was supporting athletes. He was supporting sports persons by raising money for them. Right? Um, he decided, after he came back from the hospital, that he would go for a very, very radical surgery to fix himself up. And at the age of 42, it was a very, very risky surgery to undertake because <laughs> gradually over time his body had really, really become very rigidly fixed in a particular posture. And one doctor said that, look, it's terribly risky, but I will go ahead and do it if you want to go for it. And the hospital did a video interview with him. And they asked him, what do you want? And he said, I want to walk back from here. Just before the surgery, exactly half an hour before his surgery. And they said, is that all you want? And he said, yeah, I, if I can run, that will be great. But I'm happy if I can walk. 48 hours later, he was not there. He had a massive heart failure after the surgery, which obviously had given him a massive shock. It was a very big surgery. So that's where it was. Um, it took me a lot of time to, to, to think it through. And then at that point of time, I spoke with Farhan. And, uh, because Farhan and, and I have worked with him very closely, we decided that we should do something that celebrates um, openness. We should do something that celebrates imagination and creativity. And we should do something that celebrates aspiration, which is what Sridhar personifies for all of us. So I'm just going to ask Farhan to say a few words, also yeah. and share you. with us about Sridhar. Yeah. So um, I mean, you know, uh, for example, how did you all know that this event was here today, right? Um, you know, uh, that this event was here today because of Sridhar's code. He uh, built the entire Lama Khan website. I mean, people say that it's so easy to get your events done at Lama Khan, but that's because of Sridhar's work. Um, he, um, he, I mean, you know, okay, I'm speaking as a programmer. We always look out for programmers that we call as 50Xers. So they are programmers who are so efficient, who know exactly how to do things that they don't beat around and take 50 days. They can actually do that work in one day. Okay. 
Uh, Sridhar was a rare breed like that. I have met precisely three people uh, who are 50Xers. And Sridhar was one of them. And actually another 50Xer, uh, Imran, actually uh, introduced me to Sridhar. What really, I mean, so probably the city has 150Xers. Most of them work for Microsoft and Google, etc. Um, what was really amazing about Sridhar is that he refused to work at Google's and Microsoft's. And he threw himself at problems that were of far more importance to uh, the society, right? And a lot of this work was done gratis or at very nominal charges. I mean, you know, he would take it as an honorarium almost for a couple of hundred rupees, couple of thousand rupees. I mean, whatever one could, you know, imagine that one can, you know, present to him. Um, so, you know, from COVID relief to water logging in the city to crime against women, I mean, he threw himself at these problems, which are not glamorous from a software developer's perspective, from a, a programmer's perspective. A programmer would rather, you know, spend a month writing a new compiler for Rust or writing AI, etc. But he knew that there was a lot to be done with simple lines of code which affect, you know, thousands of people and they will continue to, you know, be of use to us. So, you know, he's not here, but we will continue to celebrate his work. And the fact that he was, you know, primarily, I mean, if you asked him, who are you, he would say that I'm a programmer. So, uh, the series of memory lectures which we will have from now on in his memory here, um, uh, will be focusing on the role of software and technology in the human society. And that is, uh, and it's, it's amazing that, you know, we uh, coincidentally, I mean, right about the time that we were having this conversation that uh, Paranjay Sahab, uh, you know, called up and said that he was going to be in town and that, you know, uh, we said, you know, it would be lovely if you could speak here and we could also launch uh, the Sridhar Memorial Lectures with him as the foundation lecture for us. So. Uh, his father is here. Uh, sir, would you like to speak? Yeah, sure. Any language, you know, you want to tell ah, you Hindi or... Okay, I will try to speak in. Uh, my name is P. Narsimlo, father of Sridhar. My native place is near Sangareddy. And uh, I work in Electronics Corporation of India, Hyderabad ECIL, and retired in 2010. And uh, out of my two sons, Sridhar is the younger one. He studied in DAE Central School near ECIL. And he was very intelligent. And he stood first in the mathematics in the 10th. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, at that time, there was an advertisement in the papers that those who are studying 10th class, the advertisement was from the railways. So advertisement said those who are studying 10th class only can write the examination. And if once they are selected, job is guaranteed as a ticket collector, train examiner like that. So he was selected for that. Accidentally, just like that, he attended and he got selected. Then I was in a dilemma, what to do? Then some, I have contacted friends and known people like you. Some persons advised me, why you stop his career here itself? is very brilliant. Why don't you continue studies itself? Then we contacted the personal managers of the railway department. What they said is, those who are joining, it does not mean that their life ends there itself. They can continue further studies. There are many people who joined and did higher studies and left to railways. And they come as uh, officers in the railways. And most, many people even joined officers in banks and LIC, etc. So he can continue his studies. OK, maybe his uh, fortune is like that. Finally, I joined him in the railway, this one. The thing was, they will be given two years training in railway junior college, Lalaguda. Afterwards, they will be given the job, pakka, guaranteed. 
So like that he was admitted, he has undergone the training, completed the course also. The vacancies were not existing by the time when they completed the course. So they have given a letter saying that as and when the vacancies arise, you will be absorbed. So about it took six months. Unfortunately, within these six months itself, he got the pains. So we could not went for the medical test, as you know, for any government job, there will be health checkup. So he was posted at Hubli Division as a ticket examiner. I went personally there. They said, okay, you don't you lose your job, you lose your seniority only. But they have waited for six months. Afterward, they gave a final letter saying that you will lose if you don't come and join. Okay, job as it came, it went also. We were not worried about the job. And it started at the age of 18. The uh, sickness is called ankylosing spondylitis. Those who 25 years back, it was not that much this one. But it starts for girls and boys. When they enter the youthfulness, for the boys at the age of about 18, 20, for the girls at the age of about 15, 16. So I have consulted, the first doctor I have consulted was you, Ramakrishna Rao. He was working in Apollo Hospital. Like that, we tried, but all the doctors raised their hands. That's all. So they could not, they tried their best, but somehow, unfortunately, they were not in a position to cure his disease. The disease is like that. The disease was identified by Sri Jaswant Rao. Now he is no more uh, ex-Gandhi Hospital superintendent. He diagnosed, he said, unidentified polyarthritis. He said there is no medicine for this. He clarified 25 years back itself. He, initially, he was having some pains in the knees, etc. But later on, uh, there was no pain. He was fixed like this, as you can see in the wheelchair. His position was like that. But since one year, actually, that bend has become more, more and more. He was not able to eat. And because of this folding, whatever food he has taken, he was not able to digest. Because of that, he was having gas problem, no sleeping. Like that, it was going on for one year. We have contacted one or two spine surgeons. They said it cannot be done. But finally, one doctor advised there is only one doctor. If anything can be done, he only can do. He is in that medical or hospital high tech city. Our idea was to go for spinal cord operation, actually. Uh, that doctor said spinal surgery is a very complicated one because he bent like this. It cannot be done. First, let us go for the hip surgery. And he becomes straight, I think, uh, after the operation. So accordingly, as per their advice, we went for the, but they said, uh, risk is there, 20% risk is there. If you are unlucky, he could be one of those 20. But finally said, he is suffering. If suppose he is not suffering, there is no problem. He is suffering, he is not able to live his uh, life happily. So that is how his operation was done. Uh, operation was successful also at about, uh, he was admitted in the IC at about 5 o'clock. I went there and saw him. And uh, I can say, fortunately, I went at 9 o'clock to him that night. I talked to him. Uh, he said, how is, he said, okay, if I move only, I am having little pain. Then he said, I am feeling thirsty. Then I said, okay, today only operation is done. They may give water tomorrow. Then he said, what is the time now? I said, it is night, 9 o'clock. Then he said, oh, is it 9 o'clock, 9? Uh, then he said, yes, because you are in that uh, anesthesia, that is why you felt like that. Okay, I said, okay, come on, please. If I went to the room, at about 10.30, I got a call. When I went to the ICU, they said, he got the heart problem. We did CPR. He recovered, but 24 hours risk is there. We cannot say what will happen. So accordingly, at 12 o'clock, again, one more call came. I was there in my presence itself, I saw his last breath. So, as a father, I can only pray God that as per the Hinduism, there will be rebirth. Wherever he has taken the birth, he should live happily and uh, healthily. That is only my request through this one. Thank you.
so um, we are going to be doing these lectures every year and we are also thinking of setting up a scholarship uh, in Sridhar's name. We will announce that um, eventually. Um, so uh, Faran, do you want to start it? So we now uh, invite Paranjayda, please. Firstly, thank you for uh, accepting to be here. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we all know and we've all heard of uh, wo that there was this software called Pegasus, which was used by uh, a lot of governments and very strong suspicion that the Indian government has used it. In fact, we know, I mean, technically there is no doubt that they were used to spy on uh, innocent people. Um, and uh, we thought that we'd do a discussion on this because, you know, uh, Mr. Paranjay Thakurda has been working on this for a long time. I'm not introducing him because I am assuming, of course, that you know everybody who's here is here because he's here. So, um, uh, we, I mean, you know, the idea is to basically interrogate him of sorts to draw out more of what um, is the implication of this. And uh, I've been studying it on the technical side of how it works. So probably, you know, I can contribute a little bit to the understanding of how technically it works, which is very fascinating. I mean, you know, it's like watching or, you know, understanding how the atomic bomb works or, you know, any of these technologies which kill in millions, right? I mean, it's just <coughs> equally fascinating of how much effort went into making that particular piece of malware. So, uh, you know, I just start by asking you, about what exactly is Pegasus. So if, if you could, you know, first start with that. Um, uh, what does it do and what has it done, right? In terms of, uh, we know that, you know, one person was brutally butchered w using Pegasus, right? I mean, he was cut into pieces and pieces were put into sacks and the sacks were, you know, smuggled out and probably you know, boiled, boiled in acid or whatever. <laughs> Uh, that was the Khashoggi was, uh, you know, one of the victims of Pegasus as well. But, uh, you know, would you like to start there or is, is, is that a good place to start? Yeah. Um, first and foremost, thank you, Farhan. Thank you, Lama Khan. It is my honor, my privilege that I'm speaking on this occasion. Um, I did not have the honor or the privilege of meeting the person, Sridhar, in whose memory this program has been conducted. But when I told Faran that I'm coming here, he was most, uh, what should I say, he was most enthusiastic to have me here. Because I said I can speak from my own personal experience, because I'm one of the persons whose phone was reportedly within inverted commas compromised and uh, it was detected and I am one of the petitioners in the Supreme Court. So what I thought I'll do and I'll give a kind of a long uh, sort of an introduction to what happened and then you should feel free to ask me any question. Sure. sure. Now this particular spyware, malware, software, call it what you like. It is, in my opinion, and I'm not the only person to hold this opinion, it is the most dangerous spyware, cyberware, known to humankind. Therefore, I completely endorse Farhan's comparison with a nuclear bomb. 
in certain respects, perhaps, it's even more dangerous. Because the way it compromises and destroys not just your privacy, it completely militates against the notion of freedom of expression and everything that we consider important in a democracy. Now, I thought what I'll do is actually read out to you a small excerpt, one paragraph, of what this software does. The NSO group that developed this software in Israel, they thought or they claim that this software is being developed to help humankind. And I'll give you what they claim. But what they actually did was create uh, a monster. A lot of people blame Frankenstein, the Dr. Frankenstein, Shelley's novel, but actually it was the doctor thought, uh, Dr. Frankenstein thought the monster would help humankind, but it eventually ate up its, destroyed its own creator. I don't know. Uh, I can speculate on what may happen in the near future, but before I do that, it should be made very clear that it violates not just in this country, across the world, certainly in countries which call themselves a democracy, dozens of rules and dozens of laws. This is a excerpt from a petition that has been moved in a court in California by the biggest computer companies, digital companies, digital, digital giants against the NSO group. And that case is being heard and continues to be heard. These include Microsoft, Apple, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, which is part of Meta, uh, Facebook, you name it. They're, they're all there, just about everybody who's there. The, Im the big digital monopolies are all there. Google, yes, Google is also there. Now, this cyber surveillance tool is supposed to provide a service, according to NSO. What is the kind of service that they claim? Before we look into what it actually does, let's say what, what does NSO claim? They say that it's meant for law enforcing agencies. And it goes beyond, you know, tracking, say, a drug peddler, a person accused of, say, child molestation or child rape, or purveyor of child pornography, or a plain simple person suspected of having committed some crime which is loosely called an act of terror. It went beyond that. It said that, look, this is the age of UAVs or drones. We can help you track if a drone is coming into your territory, in your, in your uh, area that you consider over which you have your sovereign rights. Suppose there's a, a building which has collapsed and you suspect that there are people who are trapped inside the rubble of that building. Pegasus will help you track the mobile phones that might be there with the people who are trapped inside that building, which has now been completely destroyed. So this is the way the Israeli company, it's a private company, marketed its services. 
and its products. And it was very clear from the outset that they said that we'll only export these products and services with the prior permission and approval of the Israeli ministries, the defense ministry, their external affairs ministry, and so on and so forth. That it would be licensed to other governments and their law enforcing agencies. All sounds very good. The problem is, today, they are reluctant to acknowledge it, but it went way, way beyond what they thought or what they claimed it would do. These government agencies, whether it was misused by them, whether others deliberately or with the complicity of these law, law enforcing agencies acquired this software, the, so the point is it became a tool of surveillance and a tool to target all those who are opposed to that government or to that particular regime. And this is happening across the world. Okay. This is how it's described that these tools, and Pegasus One is one of them, there are other companies which are making similar products and services. These tools allow the user to track someone's whereabouts, listen into their conversations, read their texts, their emails look at their photographs, steal all the names and people on their list of contacts, download all their data, review their internal search history, and much, much more. So governments then use it to spy on not just political opponents, human rights activists, other activists, journalists, and others. Now, the, it violates a whole lot of laws within India, within the US, and everybody. So, this software has been misused in a way no other software anywhere in the world has. How do we know this? And let me refer to my notes as I talk to you. And for all those who are interested in the subject, there's a lot more. There's a lot more uh, that I will not be able to discuss in the, within the, in the limited confines of this conversation. It started out, it was initially, it was put together just as a, I think in 2016, 2017, it started getting developed. At that time, there would be what is called a clickbait. That means you have to click on a particular URL sent to you, and that would enable malware to infect your phone. And that then would become like what they call in Farhan's parlance, a Trojan that would do all these things. But first, you had to click on this. I'll just explain what click, clickbait does. So for example, you get, a, you get a, an SMS, OK, saying that uh, your bank, you know, your SBI bank account password is expiring. Please uh, reset your password, OK? And there's a link provided, which looks like SBI. So instead of saying sbi.com, it will say sb1.com. So you think that it is SBI, but there's a slight spelling mistake. So they have taken a new domain name and set up a new website. When you click on that, you get to that website, which looks like your State Bank of India website, which asks you to put in your password and ID. And that keeps saying, you know, Beware of phishing and all that. I mean, all those things are actually given on that because it's a complete replica of the original website. And there you put in your user ID and your password and you click. And what happens is now they have your user ID password and they very quickly, they will then go in and 
log on to your website. Now imagine if they did the same thing with your Gmail account, right? Then they get access to the Gmail account and on the Gmail account, once they have the Gmail account, they can actually put stuff into your G drive, etc., which will actually, you know, then come back into your computer and on the computer now it can, you know, roam in your computer, pick up data and do everything. So that's a clickbait, which is you bait somebody to click on a link by pretending to be a known website, but it's not that, or it's something very interesting, right? I mean, uh, it, it, you can say, you know, I have sent you nude pictures of Narendra Modi, you know, watch it or something like that. And you'll, you'll click on it and then you see that it is, you know, I mean, okay, all right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Then thanks for that explanation. So, from this kind of a situation where you are fooled into believing something that's been sent to you and you become a victim, the latest generation of Pegasus is something which is called the zero click. So, a zero click way in which you infect, you compromise, you infiltrate into somebody else's mobile phone or computer. So the malware enters your phone, but you don't even know it has. Now, interestingly, even the companies that claimed very, very secure systems, including Apple, they said that, you know, Apple, our, our machines, our, our uh, handsets are very expensive, but uh, this is one of the reasons why is that it's very secure. You know, your viruses can't get in and, you know, you can't be compromised. Now, the NSO was able to get into Apple as well. And after this whole uh, episode called the Pegasus Project took place, your, um, they put out a new patch ostensibly to check what was happening. So let me try and explain to you how all this entered the public domain. The Pegasus project, as it was called, was formally made public in July 2021. But work on it had begun at least about a year and a half earlier. I was asked this question by the Supreme Court appointed committee. They said, who do you think provided the leak? What was the leak? The leak was roughly 50,000 telephone numbers. Now, you knew that from the first few digits, which country it belonged to. But even when you use software like Truecaller and others, you don't know who the phone belongs to. So then you have to start taking the assistance of organizations in these countries. It was quite a, quite a project, you see. When you look at it, the material was leaked to a Paris-based international non-government organization <coughs> called Forbidden Stories. Forbidden Stories, in turn, tied up with Amnesty International, and Amnesty International's own security laboratory tied up with the University of Toronto, where they have a lab, which is called the Citizens Lab, which is supposed to be one of the world's most advanced forensic laboratories and it is used by law enforcing agencies across the world. It is part of the University of Toronto. Now, what Amnesty International and Forbidden Stories did was it tied up with roughly 17 media organizations and 80 journalists, over 80 journalists who were part, they were sort of literally sworn to secrecy and said that, look, you're working with us, but until we do all the analysis, all the deep digging, you, you, ha you have to, um, we are taking you into confidence. This is the way uh, several organizations have worked in the past, including the 
ICFJ, the International Consortium, um, sorry, ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, including the people who put out the Paradise Papers, the Panama Papers, which were leaks that came from individual organizations about corporates. So people ask me, who do you think leaked the data? And I think my hunch, my instinct tells me it was somebody from within NSO. Where would you get this data? NSO, of course, denies that they don't know. Once they sell, sold their software to a particular country or its law enforcing agency, they don't know what's happening after that. They, they feign complete ignorance, but obviously there was something somewhere. And I'll also tell you why it happened. And uh, I think this is a, I'm, I'm, what I would be making would be reasonable guesses. The government in Israel changed. Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, he lost power and Bennett became the next head of the Israeli government. And Bennett suspected that his own supporters were being spied on by the Israeli police. So there is a political opponent. And I'll talk later about what are the consequences now that Netanyahu is back in power in Tel Aviv. But the countries where they found that these numbers existed, there were several of them. And I'll just give you the list. I'll give you the list of them. Poland, Hungary, Mexico, South Africa, Morocco, Israel, France, Pakistan, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, Kazakhstan, Rwanda, Saudi Arabia, Union, uh, um, the United Arab Emirates, the UAE. Clearly, they didn't have Russia or the People's Republic of China. But not very surprisingly, the biggest number came from India. The maximum number came. And these organizations that were sworn to secrecy to work on the project included the Washington Post, the Guardian, Le Monde, the Israeli uh, media organization called Haaretz, Daizite, The Wire in India. And then they started getting in to what was asked each of these organizations to start looking into what was happening. And they came up with names of five serving or former heads of government, including the or heads of government or heads of state. Mexico, South Africa, Morocco, Pakistan, Imran Khan's associates were among the people, France, Hungary, Mexico, all these, their heads. And all these countries, unlike India, have initiated official investigations into how Pegasus was misused. And India's story is a fascinating story, but it also tells you gives you an insight about how our government works or does not work. Let me give you just a, a random list of some of the people whose numbers could be identified and established. Rahul Gandhi, the wire deliberately blacked out some of his personal associates who were not politically connected with him. But there were several of his personal aides and people who worked with him as part of his political team. There was Prashant Kishore. At that time, he was, um, well, working with various political organizations. And interestingly, they found that his phone had been tapped precisely at the time when he was going to meet Rahul Gandhi and Priyanka Gandhi. 
then there was the chief minister of west bengal her nephew abhishek banerji he was another guy but and this is very interesting those in power they not only suspect their political opponents when they have this amazing spy spyware tool they start spying on people their own example the gentleman who went on to become interestingly and ironically the information technology minister the minister for communications railways and um, the ministry of electronics and information technology ashwini vaishnav he and his wife the former personal secretary to the former prime minister uh, former chief minister of rajasthan vasundhara raje his phone was found to be tapped a minister the water resources minister the jal shakti minister praful singh Pat patel his phone was tapped and the former osd to the officer on special duty to mrs smriti irani his phone was also tapped there is a judge judge of the supreme court justice arun mishra who is now the head uh, of the national human rights commission they found that he a phone that he used to use was tapped they found that the junior of the former attorney general of india mukul rohatgi his phone was tapped that's not all the former election commissioner ashok lavasa who is now in manila with the asian development bank his phone was stopped the ex the former director of the central bureau of investigation cbi alok varma several of his phones they found tapped a particular officer of the research and analysis wing called jitendra ojha who had challenged his um, compulsory retirement from the rnaw his phone was tapped what was interesting was that you found people who had nothing to do with politics also being tapped example dr gagandeep khan well known virologist the would it have i mean i can speculate could it be that what she was saying what she was saying in the public dom domain did not match the government of india's discourse on covid her phone was tapped officers of the supreme court of india their phones the lawyer of the absconding jeweler and diamond nirav modi who's currently in london his phone was tapped christian michael the lawyer his lawyer and not at all surprising all the people whose names figure in the bhima koregao case Hani Babu, Rona Wilson, Vernon Gonzalez, Anand Tel Tumde, Shoma Sen, Gautam Navlakha, Arun Ferreira, Sudha Bhardwaj, Bhardwaj. So it shows a certain pattern, and we find a similar pattern in other parts of the world. Farhan just mentioned about Khashoggi. They found that at the precise time. when he went to the embassy of the saudi arabia uh, in istanbul that was when he was attacked he never came out alive the princess khalifa who of the who was being tracked by her own family her friends there were people in mexico who were opposed to the regime and you find a pattern which is absolutely predictable and uh, it's clear that whether it's freedom of expression the right to privacy and all that the laws of this country 
are supposed to ensure and guarantee, um, including the provisions of the Information Technology Act, the Telegraph Act, and so on and so forth, are being completely violated. But in the case of India, and I'll talk to you in greater detail about this, why is the government not saying anything? And the sequence of events that happened, that this leads to where we are at present. And the government refuses to confirm or deny whether it has purchased this software, this spyware. It has not even denied an article which appeared in the New York Times, which says that when Narendra Modi became the first Prime Minister of India to visit Israel and met Benjamin Netanyahu, in July of 2017, there was a two billion dollar, two billion dollar armaments deal, and they believed that Pegasus was purchased as part of this deal. There has been a study done by uh, a report, rather, made by the OCCRP, the organized organized crime and corruption reporting project, which have shown that some of the equipment that was imported by the government of India in, and the Intelligence Bureau in the Ministry of Home Affairs closely matched the specifications, the technical specifications of Pegasus. And I'll tell you what happened in the Supreme Court and, and what happened thereafter. That's quite an interesting story. But maybe uh, at this point of time, Farhan, you might like to say a few things before I move on to yeah. so, why uh, we are where we are today. Yes. Uh, you know, I, I'll just tell, give you some technical inputs. One uh, important thing to realize about the Pegasus software per se is that it not only compromises the citizens, but it also compromises the government. And I'll tell you why it does that. You know, usually what happens with the spyware is that you put a part of a software into the phone or the computer and there is another part which is with you with which you can now remotely go through the computer switch on their camera switch on the mic you know record things etc etc right the remote control of pegasus is not with the government who's the client it <coughs> remains with the nso and the nso sells it on a per seat basis that is you know if you'd like to hack 20 people you give us so much money if you'd like to hack 50 people you give it so much so because it's round tripping through Israel, a lot of sensitive information is going through that. And you've installed the NSO software in your own office. Okay. Now, for NSO which has no moral fiber left in them, you think that they are not going to stop at not spying on the Indian government itself? Of course they're going to do that. You've led them into this. Right? So, uh, it's not a software that you are in complete control of. The software is provided as a service. It's not provided as a product that you just take home and you know install it on your thing and then you are on your own. Okay, and that's one. And the second thing is that the way the software works is very fascinating. Actually, you have to do nothing and it just comes into your computer. And the way it comes into your computer is that it actually gives you out uh, I mean you know for example you get a whatsapp message now anyone can send you a whatsapp message right I mean anybody can send you a whatsapp picture so it comes as a whatsapp picture and you don't even have to look at the picture if the picture comes onto your whatsapp you are compromised if somebody sends you an email with that certain picture you are compromised and I don't believe that NSO wrote the software themselves because it's more like that somebody discovered that it could be written and wrote it for years and sold it off to NSO. I can't imagine that NSO said that we should be writing a software like this. Now, why don't you guys go out and try and you know come back in 25 years time? What it does is it exploits a number of different vulnerabilities in software and brings them together in a very fascinating way. I mean, as, 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 as somebody who is a programmer and, you know, is involved with technology, it's very fascinating to see how that happens. But in a nutshell, what it does is that 
to compress a lot of images, what you do is you take these images, if they are being repeated, you just maintain one copy of it and at that position you repeat those messages, uh, 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 those images, right? For example, in, the, in English, uh, you know, text, letter E is very common, right? It's the most common letter. So if there is a picture of a text page which has got E in too many places, same font, same size, what you will do is, you will just store one picture and say, okay, this picture comes in these places and give the locations of the, that, right? At this height and width or whatever, right? At, this, at these coordinate po positions, you put this picture in. So, but to further, you know, make it look more real, at times, for example, in a photocopy or if you're taking a picture of text, there are blurred edges. At times, it's, you know, uh, you miss a couple of pixels in some and in the others, you don't. So what they did is, in this compression, uh, software to keep the image size small, they said that we will store the difference between two images of the same letter. Okay, and these images, between them both, there might be additional pixels or there might be fewer pixels. So they had this, you know, facility within that compression algorithm uh, or in the format of the picture that you can specify that this image is a little like the other images which is happening in some other part of the same picture, but these pixels are different, right? Which means essentially that it could take two pictures and merge them together and say which are the places where a zero is turning into one or a one is turning into zero, right? Just that. Now, just hold on to that thought. A computer does exactly that, which is it flips zeros to ones and ones to zeros. So if there are, if you say I've, I'm giving you zero and one, the output is one zero. Or if you're giving, you know, zero, zero plus zero is zero, one plus one is two, which is written as one zero in binary, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They just use that facility to build a virtual computer inside the image. Okay, really fascinating that they actually build a virtual. I mean, using those zeros and ones, they build logic gates. Using the logic gates, they build a CPU. They build a memory. Everything within the picture image itself, and they build a whole computer which could actually operate, which could use its own machine code and execute a command. Okay, having done this, it will operate only within its own self. They also figured out that there were certain softwares where if you keep, for example, adding one on one on one on one on one, at some point it will roll back because you know, you have only that many digits, right? You must have seen this on speedometers. You know, you have only five digits, so after 99,999 9, kilometers, it becomes zero. In computers, when it rolls, it actually becomes negative. That's how binary works. So they figured out if they spun the image far enough, it will point to pixels which are not in the image but elsewhere, outside, in the other memory. And they used that to shift this program from inside the image to outside the image. And there they again execute this program. They run this program, which now pulls in the actual program which does the spine. So it's really a fascinating piece of software. It must have taken years to write. My suspicion is, and this often happens, in the dark web, right, of TORS and, uh, you know, Bitcoins, etc. If somebody finds out a hack, they put it for auction with bitcoins, etc., and people buy it for a huge amount because this is worth a lot, right? I mean, each of these sales is about hundred hundred million dollars. Each Pegasus, you know, uh, uh, installation is about hundred million dollars. So somebody was paid a huge amount, fifty million dollars, probably hundred million dollars. I don't know how much. It's quite possible that that's also the person who's leaked it because you know they would have the technical chops to do this. Sorry, Panja. Okay. Uh, very, very interesting what you are highlighting from your perspective, Farhan. Um, I'll focus on India because I know a little bit more about India. Interestingly, the former member of parliament belonging to the Bharatiya Janata Party, Dr. Subramaniam Swami, pointed out some very interesting facts. If you go very carefully through the budget papers of the Union of India, the government of India, and specifically look at the expenditure of the National Security Secretary, the, the Office of the National Secu uh, Security Advisor, which is Mr. Ajit Dobal at present, 
and you start looking at their budget over the years and you will see how the amounts that is being spent under one head called cyber security has shot up it shot up from where it was in 2014 15 over the next 4 or 5 years this is information in the public domain you don't know the budgets of RNAW, which is under the cabinet secretariat, you don't know the budget of the inf uh, of the intelligence bureau, which comes under the Ministry of Home Affairs, but you'll find these broad categories, and there you'll find that under this head of in the National Security uh, Council secretariat, the office of the National Security Council, how it has gone up. So, just an idea because as Farhan pointed out, this is expensive business. He's talking in millions of dollars. It's costing crores of rupees. The, the arms deal, and you don't know how much of it was missiles and armaments and guns, but it was $2 billion according to the New York Times, something that has not been disputed. So when in July 2021, all this came out, Interestingly, what was the reaction of the government? Just denial, just denial. No, we haven't violated any law. Even when the earlier case of uh, when the clickbaits were being used, when the information of uh, the Minister for Law and Justice and also Information Technology and the Communications, Mr. Ravi Shankar Prasad, he also said, no, no, I don't think we have violated any law. I mean, you can see this. So the question that would now arise, you can explain why the government reacted the way it did. Because that would be also, they would be admitting that they lied to parliament. It, it's a separate matter that what parliament means to this regime is another story altogether. But having all this is part of the records in the form of statements that are there in the public domain. Interestingly, the first leak happened in July, it was a weekend on a Sunday night at about 10 o'clock. Next morning, Parliament was to begin. The monsoon session of Parliament was to begin. And sure enough, Mr. Amit Shah says they are out to Malay in India, the government of India. I mean, the obvious question was, how come, you know, there are so many countries involved, uh, about a dozen countries involved, there are 50,000 numbers spread across all these dozen companies, how come it's there to Malay in India? It's an obvious question. It's also perhaps entirely a coincidence that that was the day the Income Tax Department raided the offices of uh, the publishers of one of India's and one of the world's most widely circulated newspapers, that is Dainik Bhaskar. Be that as it may, the several of us, we moved the Supreme Court. And the Solicitor General of India, Mr. Tushar Mehta, kept saying something. He says, I will neither say yes or no. The then Chief Justice of India, Justice Ramana, kept asking him, please answer one question. Has any agency of the government of India purchased this software? And he says, I will not answer your question. So he says, why will you not answer my question? This will compromise the national security of the country. That was his response. Finally, Justice Ramana says, OK, I don't have a choice. I'll set up a committee. It took him several weeks, actually, put together the committee. Finally, on the 27th of October, 2021, he announced the constitution of a committee which was headed by a former judge of the Supreme Court of India, Justice Ravindran, uh, R.V. Ravindran. And it comprised several people. One of the main persons uh, who uh, was virtually acting like a, sort of a, the secretary of that committee was Mr. Alok Joshi. He's a former officer of the Indian Police Service. And uh, he has, he was not just the joint director of the Intelligence Bureau, he was the head of the, um, uh, rather he was the secretary of the research and analysis wing, 
and one of its most important bodies called the NTRO, the National Technical Research Organization. And interestingly, Mr. Joshi had served in this position from the time Dr. Manmohan Singh was the Prime Minister till the time when Mr. Narendra Modi became the Prime Minister of this country. The other person uh, who helped him was a technical person called Dr. S Sandeep Oberoi. He used to earlier work with uh, TCS at the, um, um, he used to work at various um, corporate bodies, but more importantly, he was the head of the international, or he was a chairman of the International Organization of Standardization, the International Electrotechnical Commission, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then there were three members of the technical committee. One was uh, Dr. Naveen Kumar Chaudhary. He was professor of cybersecurity and digital forensics at the, and dean of the National Forensic Sciences uh, University in Gandhinagar. And he's also a cybersecurity expert. And it may be purely coincidental, but uh, this particular uh, university was inaugurated when Mr. Narendra Modi was the Chief Minister of Gujarat. There was uh, Dr. Prabhaharan. He was professor of the School of Engineering at the Amrita Vishwa Vidya Pitsam at Amrita Puri in Kerala. And he was also in, uh, an expert on malware detection, etc. And the third person was from the Indian Institute of Technology. Um, that's Dr. Ashwin Anil Gumaste. He's um, Associate Professor of Computer Sciences and Engineering. And he's authored, he has 20 US patents, 150 papers, three books. He's got the Shanti Swaru Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology in 2018. Vikram Sarabhai is, just all of them are, have very, very, he's held the position of a visiting scientist at the Massachusetts information technology. It's purely coincidental that he's also, some of his articles have appeared in a website called Swarajya, which is, um, I, uh, many would consider that to be right wing anyway. Again, purely coincidental. They started working and they found several people, including me. We agreed to have our phones examined. It took them hours. Me, oh, there were about 10 or 12 people. We agreed to have our phones forensically examined. There's an interesting sidelight to this. There was um, another commission of inquiry that was set up by the government of West Bengal, headed by a former judge of the Supreme Court of India, Justice Madan Lokur, and a former acting chief, ju chief justice of the High Court of Calcutta. Uh, Justice Jyotir Moy, I think his name is Roy Chaudhary. No, Bhattacharya, I stand corrected. Now, interestingly, even as this commission was working, and I was one of the people who deposed before that commission, the Supreme Court said, you can't work, you can't do this. And this was based on a petition moved by a non-government organization with very close links to the Haryana government and the Bharati Janta Party and the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sang. If you want the details, I have them. An article written by some of my colleagues have appeared. So the West Bengal inquiry was completely quashed. Nothing happened. It went into limbo. And nothing more happened after that. They gave me the hashtag, uh, hash values, etc. Uh, in my case, they took a long time giving me the hash values. They said, ah, a matter of few hours. It took them actually days before they gave it, but at least they gave it. So my phone, I know because they were, it was examined five times, thrice in Canada, and once in Calcutta, and once at the IIT in Delhi. I want to make two points quickly, and then I'll hand it over back to Farhan. Several people refused to share their phones with this committee. Several people. But whatever they did, they presented a report before Justice Ramana, who was then still the Chief Justice of India. And it was just a few days before he, com he completed his term. 
On the day before he completed his term as Chief Justice, he, together with two other judges, took out this sealed envelope and brought out a voluminous document and says, you know, there are some observations and recommendations which can be made public. Uh, it hasn't been made public, but he said in the open court. But significantly, he said that the government did not cooperate with the committee. So the technical committee set up by the Supreme Court of India, the government of India chose not to cooperate because everybody was asking. They put my deposition, they put the deposition of huge others, you know, all online. You can still see them. The questions that were asked of me, the questions that the, what my responses were, everything is in the public domain. It was a very transparent way they did it. But everybody was asking, have you spoken to the government? Have you spoken to anybody in the government? And finally, the Supreme Court, on the day before he demitted office, he said no. So this was approximately two months back. Justice Ramana said, put the report back and reseal that envelope. And he said the next date of hearing will be at the end of September. That hasn't begun yet. So we don't know. Uh, it didn't happen during Justice Yu Yu Lalit's term as Chief Justice. Time will tell whether the present Chief Justice, Chandrachud, will take up the matter and when it will. I want to make one small point, and again, it's for my personal uh, experience, that will uh, throw some light on, it's not just, you know, they're listening into what you're talking to your wife. Yeah, they must be listening into a lot of trivial conversation. What food would you like to eat? Would you like urad dal or chanaki dal? But I believe I speak in three languages. My mother tongue is Bangla. I speak in Hindi and in English. You require substantial back-end operations. Even if you assume every single word, every single minute of what I've spoken, so many hours each day is being recorded by somebody or the other. Somebody has to go through it. And I believe you can't do it entirely through ca you know, these so-called catchphrases, machine learning, artificial intelligence. So every time the word Narendra Modi comes up, they stop and they hear. Or every time Amit Shah comes up, no. I think uh, there is need, human intervention is required. I mean, why would Prashant Kishore's phone be tapped precisely at the point he was going to visit Rahul Gandhi or Priyanka Gandhi? That's one point. The last point that I wanted to make is the chilling effect it has. My own sources have dried up. It's not just my friends, my relatives. So my phone is right now there. They're probably listening in. It's in that bag. Just in front of where Kranti the revolutionary is sitting. And maybe they are listening. Maybe they have such important software that they can even listen to everything you, me, Farhan is saying. That's not it. People then become wary. I was asked, who tapped my phone? And this is, this guy said, we don't know. Then they said, we have evidence which is put out in the public domain and it's available in Amnesty's own report to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court Appointed Committee. In my case, they said your phone was compromised in the months of March, April, and May 2018. But I got to know about it two years later. And after I got to know about it two years later, they asked me, what were you doing at that point of time? So I said, uh, there were two articles I was working on at that point of time. You can read them. The first one was about the late Dhirubhai, the, the late Dhirubhai Ambani's foreign assets and how they moved from one tax haven to another tax haven to another tax haven. It was interesting because it was a leak that came to me. It was a leak given to me, and all the facts were right, including the accounts of the banks. And 
there were charts to show how the money had moved from A to B to C. And even after two weeks, neither Mr. Mukesh Ambani nor Mr. Anil Ambani nor their lawyers responded to me. I said, this is a questionnaire we have, one, two, three, four, five, six question. Please respond. Please tell me if facts are correct. There was no response. The story said, despite all this information, being with the income tax department, with the government of India, why are they not acting? Please read the article if you want to. It appeared in News Click. The title is Carving Up a Business Empire Through Tax Havens the Ambani Way. The second article or the series of articles that I worked on eventually became a book that was published in 2019. It was called The Real Face of Facebook in India. So I'm just stopping here now just to tell you from my own personal experience and you're free to connect the dots and draw your own conclusions. Uh, there are, uh, you know, some very interesting things which uh, Paranjoy has uh, you know, brought out. And, um, I mean, until now what I was talking about, the way it works and all that is completely based on facts, on, uh, you know, disassembling the, the, the Pegasus malware, etc. But here I'm stepping into conjecture, but not too much of a conjecture. I'm pretty convinced about what I'm going to say. Uh, because uh, my work involves working with some of these, in some of these areas, which is this, that if phones are being tapped, there are about three or four organizations in India which, uh, which can legally do this, okay? Um, Intelligence Bureau is one of them. Okay, uh, there are many others, right, uh, which, which can do this. And there are some on which there are a lot of restrictions on how they do it. Okay, uh, for example, the NTRO operates in, uh, I mean, when it was carved out NTRO, it was basically carved out to, uh, in the aftermath of 2005, when we had the Cargill War and the U.S. refused to, uh, share, um, uh, they say GPS data, but it was not GPS data. They refused to share pictures and satellite imagery, uh, which led us to making our own Rohini, you know, series of satellites, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, to do that, but then they realized that we need to have our own organization, which will be able to generate this sort of data for us. So it works under extremely strict rules. Uh, one of them, for example, is that they will not transmit anything. Okay for whatever reasons they have a rule like that which means that they cannot buy anything which can transmit data wirelessly it can only receive data uh, and things like that uh, they require i mean a lot of them require permissions from others for example if you have to actually tap a phone you require a sub magistrate's permission uh, before you can do that. So you have to and, go to... And yeah. there is a procedure laid down. Right. Yeah. And the right on top, I mean, there are... The people have to be authorized by the Home Secretary, the Secretary, Ministry of Home Affairs, or the Cabinet Secretary. Or the Cabinet Secretary, right. Yeah. And in case of state governments also, there is a certain procedure to be followed. Now, uh, there is no trace of Pegasus anywhere in all this. And, you know, I mean, things like this... Uh, become public knowledge after a while. For example, S.A.R. Jilani's phone was illegally tapped by a sub-inspector without going through the regular uh, you know, process of law. Um, and that became a big point in the parliament attack case. Uh, and he actually was proved innocent by that particular thing that you know, he had nothing to do with it because it's there on record that you know, he's wondering what's going on. Um, so in which case, who was operating Pegasus and who is operating Pegasus? What is this dirty works department that has no government oversight? Where there are Israeli actors who have complete access to this technology, which is penetrated into people who might become prime ministers of India, who might become justices of India, chief justices of India, etc., etc. And it's a complete rogue operation. It has there is no uh, there is no parallel of this in in the indian government at all
and you know on the other hand the news has come out that Pegasus was offered time and again to the Federal Bureau of Investigations, the FBI in the US, and they refused to take it for precisely these reasons. The, uh, the New York Times says the Federal Bureau of Investigation did purchase the software ostensibly to experiment what they could do it. Finally, they chose not to buy it, and they put the sales of this software on a blacklist. So uh, they, they figured out that the software uh, goes against all the laws, including the laws that, uh, that control espionage and you know, interceptions, that is lawful uh, uh, interception. So if you see then, none of the developing country, you know, developed countries where you know, there is some at least semblance of uh, law operating, they were very scared to take the software on because the software has is immoral i mean you know it's not immoral it's it has it has no fiber of any ethics in it at all there are no limits to what it can do right for example it can put a message into your phone which claims to be from a person who never sent it to you it can start off a war okay so given that sort of a nature where it's intrusive where it does anything that's possible um, lot of governments who must have been offered the software have backed off from it. And there are a lot of governments who are victims of it. For example, the government of France right now, who would tap the phone of Prime Minister of, of you know, France or you know, Germany? And why would do th they do that? I mean, you know, there is... And the, the rumor is that a lot of countries have refused to acknowledge that their top leadership was spied on. In fact, yeah. there are inquiries going on right now, as I mentioned earlier, in Mexico, in Hungary, in South Africa, in Morocco, in France. Yeah. Because the head of the government is involved, yeah. absolutely. Uh, we do not know finally what the outcome would be, but and as, as I mentioned, in Israel itself, at one point of time, there was speculation that NSO would go under, that the company was, would not be able to survive. And uh, eventually, um, there was speculation that it would be bought up by some other company, some US company. But they have been in a complete state of denial, as, as if nothing has happened. I mean, and the closest they came in, you know, we are selling it through our government to country A. What happens after that, we can't do anything. But I think if you believe that, you would be naive. And all I can suggest is, you know, we've, we've been hearing about the new age of surveillance capitalism. Books have been written on the subject. <laughs> we are saying George Orwell's 1984 is here and now, and it's Aldous Huxley's Brave New World is here and now. It's a combination of everything. But this is the new world that we are living in. And the question is, what should you do? What can you do? Yes, there are ways, of course. You can put your phone inside your microwave oven. Don't put the microwave on, please. And like put it inside a refrigerator. Better still, don't use your phone. I want to have a personal conversation with Farhan. So he keeps his phone here, we go there. We take a walk. Maybe that these are the only I've come to a stage where I'm just uh, taking extra precautions. And I'm telling my friends, people ask me, what have you done with your phone? Why haven't you got a new phone? So I said, very kind of you to be so concerned about me, or concerned about, please give me a new phone. And if you want to give me a new phone, give me the best, no? iPhone 14, 1.3 lakh rupees. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But what I'm trying to say is, is this the way forward? Is this the way we have to lead our lives? What, what is our notion of democracy? What is our notion of privacy? What, what is our notion of freedom of expression? It's interesting. 
that the very same social media monopolies, including Meta, including Google, they swear by these same principles, freedom of expression, privacy. But what we are seeing is a different story altogether. So what, what I wonder, and, and I very, very seriously wonder as a, as a citizen, is this issue of in, does it concern people? And I must say, there are several people say, oh, this is not an issue. What is privacy in India? It's not, there's no privacy in India. The poor live under circumstances where, you know, they sleep, they bathe out in the open for the world to see. So what is this notion of privacy? Can it become an issue of public concern? They think, no, in India it won't. Food, clothing, shelter, jobs, healthcare, education, these may be more important issues. This is not an issue. This is how some people argue. I'm merely articulating what I've heard from several people. That's it. Yes, uh, thank you, Paranjoy. Uh, thank you so much. You know, the, 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 the thing is, is that to, to, to put it into a, uh, a different context, okay, we have to, uh, we have to confront the fact that the code that is a software is becoming more powerful than democracy. Okay, the software has no politics, or it has its own politics, and you know whether it's Google, etc. I mean, there was this entire thing about the open source movement, and but I'm not so sure because now most of the software that many companies use, you know, from open source, for example, Google is all written using Linux, but what does Google do with it? We don't know. It's all moving to cloud where and they're just milking all your data out and they are profiling you and they're targeting you etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's a it's a moment for us of our reckoning of where do we draw the line and how much do we allow the technology to intrude in our lives pegasus is just one expression of how uh, horrible and how rogue it can go but on the other hand there's a banality of what's around you. You know, Twitter, for example, has been taken over by Elon Musk. I mean, he is one of the most vicious persons that you can imagine. Uh, what is he going to do with it? Where is he going to turn it into? And the amount of data which is there with Twitter, how is he going to deploy it against you know his perceived enemies? I mean, he's he's a Trump in making, or he's already there probably. Um, or, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, I mean, there are these individuals who now have an immense power over you. You would imagine that the power flows from the barrel of a gun, you know. That's no longer true. Power is in data. And if we do not know this, we will not be able to fight it. Our liberties, our personal liberties, our political liberties, our very existence, you know, Facts, data, whether it's about climate, whether it's about your safety, crimes, all this is now going to be data. And all of this is being compromised by us by just accepting that, you know, privacy is not a big deal. That, you know, all right, they spied on, you know, 50 people, what's a big deal out of 1.2 billion people? That's never the point. And unless we learn to say no, unless we make it into an issue which will rattle them like the farmers agitation did or the CAA did, we are in for a very rough ride. Thank you tonight for uh, Paranjay ji. You, he's still here and we can have a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations. Would you like to have some questions? We'll take a couple of questions before we wind up. Anant, would you like to ask something? There is Naeem with... Thanks Paranjay and Farhan. This is a lovely uh, informative conversation. Um, I, I, I get the point that there is a certain amount of personal 
hygiene that one must practice I mean, it's like practice, practicing hygiene to protect yourself against any kind of virus sure but that's really not going to help when when what you're looking at is 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 a is a, is a virus that can that can be a killer and that can travel across international boundaries it's also not something that can be handled by national courts or national judicial systems or by your constitutions clearly what's going on here has um, some international dimensions but i think it's also uh, something that's happening a little above the international scale right so for something like like you might have a who which can do something about the pandemic are there any organizations networks efforts that are coming into place to deal with potential uh, uh, flare ups of evil like this because this is obviously something that's happening at a much bigger scale and all over the place so i, I can imagine i can imagine networks and and collaborations that might be happening across countries across national boundaries from individuals or even maybe smaller organizations but are there larger formations that can actually emerge because without those larger formations which can take some kind of a position on these issues i don't see how we can actually um, ever sleep um, knowing that you're going to be safe you're never going to be safe There's nothing to place your faith in so shall i react uh, you know uh, anand i couldn't agree with you more which would bring us to uh, certain bigger issues and certain unresolved or should i say ongoing discussions and debates that are happening across the world first the issues transcend the individual and as you rightly pointed out it also goes beyond individual countries or nation states so if there are roughly 200 nation states or countries across the globe there are some issues which concern all of us everybody including what we would like to describe as totalitarian regimes or dictatorial regimes or regimes which have constricted individual freedom and you know nobody would like to say we are not a democracy everybody says we are a, even the most authoritarian leader would claim that she or he is not authoritarian right now this issue of internet governance remains a very live issue and unresolved there are several stakeholders one is of course big data the big guys fang you're talking about meta and you're talking about alphabet you're talking about amazon you're talking about apple you're talking about you you know those guys they're all there alibaba was a part of that group now he's been cut down to size so you can say it's the government of the prc i mean clearly he didn't want jack ma to become more powerful than him and told him in so many words and he's had to shut his mouth now one set of players is really big data then come the governments then come different multilateral plurilateral supranational bodies including the un bodies including your ITU the international telecommunications union including UNCTAD the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development including some non UN organizations like uh, say the WTO and the whole issue of the trade related intellectual property rights then you have another set of stakeholders which is academia and also the civil society represented by various organizations including civil society organizations you can argue theoretically that all these players in a best case scenario should have equal weight or equal say in looking ahead at what needs to be done in terms of global internet governance because and the issue of should the internet be treated as a utility electricity is water is air is even if it has been privatized in many parts of the world and in many segments but this bigger issue when you talk about regulation 
what is the internet? I mean, we today know that the big force, which was supposed to democratize the world and empower the unempowered and strengthen <laughs> democracy and weaken di dictatorships actually hasn't happened. In fact, if anything else, it has not just reinforced the status quo, it has strengthened the very same people it was supposed to liberate the rest of the world from. And this is today acknowledged by the founding fathers of the internet, including people like Tim Berners-Lee. So the way ahead looks like a difficult path ahead. But what is very clear, that personal hygiene has to happen simultaneously with action on the ground and, and greater awareness of how digital monopolies work, how governments work, how, how surveillance by governments work. And that would be linked to your notions of privacy, uh, your notions of freedom of expression and democracy. These, these are all loaded words, big words, but there is nothing else. We, one has to keep on talking, keep on explaining, especially to young people. Uh, sir, my question is uh, now uh, Apple and uh, Google Android platforms are the ones, uh, mostly Apple, I think this Pegasus uh, was uh, affected, or uh, OS of the phones, from what I read. Uh, so I, it kind of, uh, I'm kind of not convinced that uh, Apple being such a big company, a billion do billions of dollars in revenue and profits, and uh, they have, obviously they claim to be investing so much on cybersecurity and uh, uh, hiring uh, open so, uh, people from outside Apple to uh, uh, look for vulnerabilities in the system. A small Israeli private company is able to exploit their vulnerabilities. And uh, how, how can Apple justify that uh, they, they, they themselves can't uh, find vulnerabilities in their, their own re, uh, proprietary software? Apple has conceded that there were vulnerabilities. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been put, put out an extra patch for all iPhone users after Pegasus came out. Apple is among all these companies which have sued NSO in California. And that includes Cisco, it includes, as I mentioned to you, WhatsApp and LinkedIn, there's a long list of them, Microsoft, the long list of, and all the major players are there. So uh, I think NSO has also exposed the vulnerabilities in the Apple's, the Apple's but, own but security, no, and, yeah. but anyway, iPhones comprise what? A very small proportion of the total number of phones. I mean, we also need to know that um, Google or, or the Alphabet is also the owner of the software, uh, the, the, uh, the Android. Android operating system, which is used in over three fourths of all the mobile handsets yeah. in use in the world. You know, but uh, uh, to your point that, you know, how is it that Apple could not? locate these and the small company located it. Now first, I don't think that the, that the small company NSO located this. NSO purchased this from somebody who had discovered this. Um, and this is the Achilles heel of software that what Apple uses or for example for that matter what Google uses, probably about one percent of the code is actually written by them. The rest is borrowed from the open source community. Okay, and there is so much of that code written. For example, in this code, the vulnerability came from a PDF software, a PDF reader. Now, Apple cannot or did not invest in writing their own PDF reader because PDF readers are already there. The PDF reader which they used because all sorts of image formats are there and over the period of last you know 30 years of ev evolution of internet there is png there is jpeg within jpeg there are five or six new options you know there is mpeg there are there's tiff there is raw i mean there are all sorts of formats and within them there are a lot of sub formats and so somebody wrote the image compression algorithm for one of them which had this facility where you could create a machine inside that PDF itself, right? I'll leave that out. That's fair enough. 
and that there was another vulnerability vulnerability where this machine could be taken out of the pdf and put into the actual memory where it can execute like a regular program right that was a vulnerability what's called as a buffer overflow in an other different part of a program written by somebody else which also these people had borrowed in so um that's one part and the second thing is that it's impossible to verify software by the way it's not possible either through automation or through human endeavor to except for trivial softwares you know converting centigrade into fahrenheit or you know calculating simple interest or whatever stuff like that to actually verify whether the software will not crash okay in fact this is not a failing of our ability to try okay it comes from a mathematical principle called the incompleteness theorem girdles you know incompleteness theorem that every system has vulnerability in them you cannot make it's a mathematical thing like 2 plus 2 plus 4 that every system of logic will have inconsistencies which can break it so when we are in the digital domain we are forced to live with the fact that they are all going to be vulnerable it's like saying you know can we not uh you know have things which do not cut people up right there will be you know uh, a knife which will always cut you as much as it can cut a fruit so we have to make rules that people do not go around murdering each other with the same knife with a fruit knife right so that's the whole point uh, sir actually this uh, regarding algorithms uh, behind this uh, technology like yeah. encryption and all yeah. the algorithms are in open source and there are a lot yes. of community of researchers working yes. to show vulnerabilities and yeah. so that's how the trust in those algorithms yeah. is built yeah. so uh, i'm kind of thinking uh, then if the algorithms there is so much thing going on in academia why in this uh, private companies not putting out their uh, implementations of their algorithms for scrutiny by multiple it is, parties actually it is entire android software is an open source okay yeah i know but uh, what about apple even apple the core software of apple okay uh, is called darwin it's actually a unix uh, operating system which was written by carnegie mellon university that's also an open source very little of actually apple software is closed source except for the user interface their browser safari is the same as a chrome both of them use the same thing called webkit and now even microsoft uses it actually if you look at and all these companies want to take your data and they want to spy on you okay that's just short i mean the law is framed in such a way that what they do is legal and what pegasus does is illegal but they are just as intrusive okay it's not that they are not i mean for example the camera opening and closing now if you look at an android soft software it is software written by google which can at will switch on the camera right at will they can transfer pictures from your phone to google drive they are doing it all the time right except that it's legal by laws as of today and they are allowed to build products which make it legal now why would you make those laws at all or let them however benign they are and how see i mean everything is a feature right i mean but these features are very um uh, very very uh, malignant features which can be you know at any time exploited otherwise as well but they do allow these softwares to be built and these companies thrive on the ability to collect people's data personal data that's that's the business of google that's the business of facebook they are not a social networking company they are basically people who spy on you okay you that's really careful about to add to what he's saying this is the realization you think you're getting all the services free google search facebook i remember uh, everybody's birthday and their wedding anniversaries but you are the product every single bit of data is mined processed so that they can not just ascertain your preferences and it goes beyond your favorite color and your favorite food and your favorite music and your favorite film star but your behavior including your political preferences and this is exactly what people like soshana zubov wrote several years ago but m- more relevant than to predict your behavior to anticipate your behavior so if his name suddenly pops up and he says okay 
Farhan is not your friend on Facebook, you better make him a friend. There is something. Because they've been following me, they've been tracking me and him. But wait, one thing which I didn't know and I learned, a lot of people saying, okay, oh, you have Pegasus, I'll, I'll put my phone off. Or I'll put my phone in airplane mode. No, Pegasus can get in and reactivate your phone, even if you shut your phone off. Maybe if you take your SIM off, your subscriber identity module off, they won't be able to do it. But the point is you can change your phones, you can put in that software which will protect you, but there is theoretically nothing to stop a law enforcing officer. We've seen what has happened today. We've seen how the Prevention of Money Laundering Act has been weaponized. I mean, the powers that officers of the Enforcement Directorate today have are more than that of the cop, your local police officer, or even the Central Bureau of Investigation. So the possibility of misuse and abuse of the software is growing and will continue to grow, especially when you have a government by denying its use, because not only would it then acknowledge that it has been lying to parliament, but will this is the way to drag it on, not tell you. This is the post-truth world. This is the way they'll ensure that you don't know. You know, and yet the government will never say that yes, we are using it and we are misusing it. Okay, um, so we'll um, you know draw curtains on today's conversation. Thank you once more, uh, Paranjoy, for uh, being here and uh, you know. Thank you very much. Very thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, and wish you a good evening. Drive safe. <laughs>